Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for being here. And first, we just want you all to know, maybe you can see already that this event is being recorded uh, with your consent, but your face and anything that you enter into the Q&A won't appear in any publicly shared version of this recording, just in case anyone has concerns about that. It is really energizing to have Devarian Baldwin with us for today's panel conversation on community justice and the ivory tower. It's moderated by Crystal Strong with responses from Abdul Ali Mohammed and Julian Baraka Thomas. And I wanna thank all our speakers and Chiming Yang will be introducing them in just a moment. This is an urgent conversation, if not a new one, especially after this week's appalling news of the Penn Museum's keeping and using the remains of two children murdered by city authorities in the move bombing. Holding this university accountable for its effects on Philly communities is a struggle of many community and campus-based groups represented here this evening, including Penn for Pilots and Police Free Penn, it's also one of the goals of AAUP Penn, which organized this event. So just a couple of words about AAUP Penn. We are the newly formed Penn chapter of the American Association of University Professors. And that organization advocates for academic workers of all ranks and for the economic security of higher education against defunding, adjunctification, and student debt. Our chapter came together in 2020 to reject austerity measures, to push for shared institutional governance and fair employment conditions for everyone who works at Penn, and to make the university meet its obligations to the city that sustains it. That's central to the chapter's racial and community justice committee. And we're here to support the work of community and campus-based allies as well. AUP is a membership-based organization. If you teach or do research at Penn, whatever your title, we would love to have you join us so that we can act on the issues that you care about. I will share a link in the chat to our website uh, where you can see some details on how to get involved if you're interested in that. Uh, and today's event is also generously sponsored by the Wolf Humanities Center, the SNF Padeo program, and Civic House with many great co-sponsoring groups that you'll see on the poster designed by the ex excellent Julia Alexeva, who is also running tech today. And we are grateful to everyone on the Racial and Community Justice Committee for all their work in making this event happen, and especially Chi Ming as the organizational force behind so much of this event. Chi Ming Yang is an associate professor of English at Penn and serves on the Race and Community Justice Committee of AAUP Penn. She is active with the campus-based group Police Free Penn and I will turn things over to her now. Thank you all. Thanks, Emily. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, thanks, Emily, and thank you everyone for being here with us for this very important conversation. Um, I do want to take a moment for us all to acknowledge that community histories are ongoing. They might get buried, erased, or unearthed, in some cases disinterred or unethically displayed, but they matter in very material ways. Universities develop minds and ideas, yes, but they are also in the business of developing land and real estate. This university and the city of Philadelphia are built on the ancestral homelands of the Lenni Lenape people, whose descendants today include the Delaware tribe and Delaware nation of Oklahoma, the Nanticoke Lenni Lenape, Ramapo Lenape and Powhatan Renape of New Jersey, and the Muncie Delaware of Ontario. They are dispersed in part because of the colonial histories of land theft violence and oppression perpetuated by many institutions over time. This continuing history of neocolonialism is what brings us together today to learn about the role of universities in communities and as communities. As Emily mentioned, there are many wonderful sponsors and co-sponsors of today's event, including the Wolf Humanities Center, Civic House and SNF Paidea at Penn for their financial and technical support and of the many student and community groups whose names appear on the poster, toward the end of the session, I'll be sharing some of their upcoming events that might be of interest to you as well. We also have a number of free copies of Dr. Baldwin's book to give away in a raffle, and you can sign up for that at the end. Um, thank you to DeVarian um, and to our supplier, Uncle Bobby's Books, a black owned independent bookstore in Germantown, founded by Mark Lamont Hill in 2017. And it's a great alternative to Amazon. You can do your book shopping online through bookshop.org. 
Before I hand it over to our moderator, I also just want to remind you that the audience will be muted um, throughout the event, but you're welcome to type questions into the chat and we will pose as many of these as possible during the Q&A or if we can fit them in during the actual conversation, conversation itself. So now I'm honored to hand over um, things to our moderator for this panel discussion, my amazing colleague, Crystal Strong. Dr. Strong is an assistant professor at Penn in the Graduate School of Education. She's a core organizer with Black Lives Matter Philly, the Black Philly Radical Collective, and the Pan-African Activist Solidarity Network. Her research and teaching focus on student and community activism and the role of schools as sites of struggle in Africa and the diaspora. Crystal's organizing work in the city of Philadelphia, which is her hometown, centers abolition, educational justice, political prisoners, and Pan-African solidarity. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you so much, Chiming, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am so delighted to see so many people here gathered on a Friday evening. And I know from many of the faces that I'm familiar with that um, people in this gathering are truly committed to struggling toward justice. Um, I'm honored to serve as the moderator for this essential conversation about community justice in the ivory tower, which is opened up by Devarian L. Baldwin's critically important new work in the shadow of the ivory tower, how universities are plundering our cities, published this year on Bold Type Books Press. We are incredibly fortunate to be joined today by Dr. Baldwin, who will be joined in conversation with Penn Professor Jolian Thomas and Abdul Ali Muhammad, who is a West Philadelphia born and based community organizer and writer. So just to give you a preview of what's to come, the format of today's program is that we will have opening remarks from Devarian Baldwin and short presentations from our other panelists, after which we will open up the floor for deeper conversation about the stakes and possibilities of community justice in the shadow of this particular ivory tower. We invite you to ask questions and raise comments as our program proceeds, which we will keep track of and circle back to. Um, Craig Wilder, who is the author of Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities, writes in his endorsement that, quote, this brilliant study shows that higher education continues to thrive off the injustices that plague our society. And with that reality in mind, um, as has kind of been um, alluded to already, we would be remiss if we did not ground tonight's conversation in the fierce urgency of, the, of these questions in light of recent revelations about the University of Pennsylvania's documented role in injustices against Philadelphia communities past and present. This week, through the careful reporting, reporting of our panelist, Abdul Ali Muhammad, the public became aware that Penn Museum for decades was in possession of the remains of Delicia Africa and Tree Africa, who are two children murdered in the May 13th, 1985 bombing of the Move family home right here in West Philadelphia without the consent or knowledge of their families. Last week, Penn Museum publicly apologized for its unethical collection and use of the remains of enslaved and indigenous people and black Philadelphians whose graves were robbed in order to establish the, the Samuel Morton cranial collection. And this past summer, in the midst of uprisings after the merger, after the murder of George Floyd, including here in the city of Philadelphia, the Inquirer and campus abolitionist organization Police Free Penn reported that the University of Pennsylvania Police Department participated in the tear gassing and repression of West Philadelphia, which is currently the subject of a civil suit. So this is to remind us of, again, the fierce urgency of the matter of community justice and the moral, ethical, and political imperative that we grapple seriously with our complicity as a campus in injustice and what we must do to repair harms against Philadelphia communities. With that said, I am so eager to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Devarian Baldwin, who is the Paul E. Rather 
Distinguished Professor of American Studies and Founding Director of the Smart Cities Lab at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. His academic and political commitments have focused on global cities and particularly the diverse and marginalized communities that struggle to maintain sustainable lives in urban locales. Amongst multiple books and articles, including the one we are here to discuss tonight in the shadow of the ivory tower. Um, he also serves on the coordinating committee of scholars for social justice and as a distinguished lecturer for the organization of American historians. I hope you will join me in a warm zoom welcome to uh, Dr. Devarian Baldwin. Wow, uh, Crystal, thank you you so much for that introduction. I don't know if I'm going to be able to live up to the, the strength and veracity of, of those compliments and um, accolades, but thank you so much. I also want to thank uh, Chi Ming for the invitation initially and for all the organizations that are here in solidarity and to my co-conveners and conversationalists, uh, Jolian and Abdul Ali, uh, thank you so much for agreeing to be in conversation with me virtually here in West Philadelphia. Um, one day we will be convening in person, but until then, Let's get started. Uh, so you should know that the, the interest and the, the elements and the conversation around this book began as early as 2003 on the South side of Chicago, seeing the gross disparity between the black and brown communities that surrounded the Hyde Park campus of the University of Chicago. So this is something I've been thinking about for quite some time, but there is no question but as I began to finish up the comments and the remarks and the notes and the final conclusions about this project, they were, they were profoundly shaped by the summer of 2020. That this project went from simply being an academic endeavor to being in service to a social movement. That the urgency of the things that I've been engaging in in the archive had been moved to the street. And so I, I say that to you to, for you to understand that this is a social movement project. This is a, the thing that we academics, we talk about and we one day hope that our work will speak in a political way. And, and I couldn't be more blessed and grateful that this work could have that opportunity to engage, to interject, but also to be lifted up and to be pushed further by my comrades in the streets and in hallways trying to advocate for equity and social justice. Now, as we know, the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, among so many others, was different in the moment of summer 2020. They, they, had, been, they had been ongoing. We can, make, we can name multiple names over the last at least two decades. But when the pandemic forced everyone to face it and not just dismiss this reality because we were seeing it on a digital feedback loop, some things changed. And one of the things that changed is that as we began to start mentioning police abolition, defund the police, quickly longstanding campus groups began to say, well, if you're talking about citywide police, what about campus police? So other names began to surface like Stephanie Washington in New Haven, and Charles Sonji Thomas in Chicago, and even earlier, but most in, most in a more broad way, Samuel DuBose in Cincinnati, that these were individuals that were killed or shot by campus police far from the campus with public authority armed and jurisdictions sometimes over entire cities with no public oversight. So, so when, we, when, we, when we think about the trial of George Floyd and the very moment that his, that, that, uh, that man, I won't even say man, that person, Derek Chauvin's prosecution was being named, at the very same moment, Makia Bryant was being killed, a child, right before, right after a 13 year old in Chicago, Adam Toledo, was killed. So when we put Tree and Delisha next to Makia and Adam, we must understand this long standing reality of the ways in which our children are treated as adults and disposable data. So as these issues 
began to gain momentum from last summer into the present, people began to see campus violence as a window into a larger political and economic apparatus. And so the interests of the community and my scholarship began to converge in a way that could have never been foreseen. That what I had seen for the last 15 years and started to develop it in a greater way in the work and what activists and residents were beginning to see was stark. That right before our eyes, colleges and universities are the biggest employers, real estate owners, healthcare providers, and even policing agents in major cities and college towns all across the country. That on one level, this is powerful, that they can do powerful things like bring people together. They can um, uh, perform amazing surgeries and make discoveries and engage in innovations. But there is an underside for those who live in their shadows, as in West Philadelphia. That the problem here is that schools as this major force are setting the housing costs and land values for our cities. They are setting the wage ceilings for our workers. They are setting and determining the healthcare standards as major medical apparatus. And that more and most importantly in this case, they are setting the policing priorities for not just campuses, but for whole cities. So this book tells a story of higher education's growing control over our cities and those who struggle into its shadows and try to struggle to survive in the shadows. It's based over 100 interviews because so much of this scholarship talks about planning and statistical data, but I want to talk about the, the story from the perspective of those who are in the shadows, that they are a legitimate and valid uh, uh, response and way to understand what the impact of higher education is on our lives that goes beyond simply the celebratory. So with that in mind, we say, well, how did we get here? So Crystal mentioned the great scholarship of Craig Wilder. So we have already identified that the capitalist and extractive and predatory relationship between universities and people of color goes back to the era of enslavement. But then we can go for and, and in that moment, you started to have, during the social justice moment, people, universities, because they will do what you make them do, they began to acknowledge, yes, okay, we're going to be DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're going to be an anti-racist university. So we'll acknowledge our relationship to slavery, to holding or benefiting from black bondage. But in that moment, we, we must be careful because we began to see universities quick to acknowledge that because of the historical distance. They began to be a little bit too haughty in their acknowledgement of slavery saying, look how far we've come, start patting themselves on the back because of the historical distance saying, this is a demonstration of our past doings, but also an indication of our progress. We are not that anymore. But in my research, I've found that we can go a little bit further and talk about the Moral Act. When universities, public universities benefited, and there's a great expose in High Country News, the land grab university, that ex exposes how public universities' land grants, their endowments, was based on the illegal seizure of indigenous lands in the 1890s. But then we can go forward to the 1920s and talk about how universities upheld uh, neighborhood associations' support of racially restrictive covenants in maintaining segregation in black and brown neighborhoods, keeping them at bay. And then we can go forward to the 1950s and 60s in the era of urban renewal, when a cabal of urban universities lobbied to change the Federal Housing Act of 1949 to give $2 from the federal government for every dollar by the city for any urban renewal project that was connected to a university. And yes, UPenn was in the mix. So when we look at the University City Science Center, the first research park in a city in America, it was underwritten by this program where approximately 600 African-American and low-income neighbors communities or residents were pushed out of the West Philadelphia to make place or make way for this science center. And UPenn stood next to Columbia, U Chicago, a educational complex in Denver, a complex in Cleveland, a complex at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, for a number of urban universities that engaged in urban renewal in the purpose of residential segregation, community demolition. But then that's not enough. So stop patting yourself in your back, universities. It's, it's, it's not old history. It's new history. And it's in our present. So coming up to the present, in the 1980s, we have the rise of what we're calling the knowledge economy. What is that? 
Well, universities have always benefited from uh, support federal dollars from research and development from, from the federal government. But with the 1980 Bo uh, 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 Boyle Act, that allowed for universities to not only benefit from federally subsidized money, but now they can convert that into intellectual property, sell their research and development on the market, and receive royalties. So a public university or private university gets federally free money and now can take that and convert it into dollars for their own royalty coffers, the buy doll Act, excuse me, B-A-Y-H slash D-O-Y-L-E, the buy doll Act. So in the current moment, we still think about universities as a schoolhouse. <laughs> when that's the least, that's a, as, as, as Craig Wilder says in his blurb, that's a side hustle for what most universities actually do. And UPenn is a part of this, like other universities, including my own. What do I mean by this? I mean that the knowledge economy is this powerful apparatus whereby colleges and universities, they use their academic research and sell it on the market to produce profitable goods and royalties in a range of fields from pharmaceuticals and software to military defense weaponry. And they reap millions in royalties for this kind of work. And the knowledge economy is at the center of America's economy today. So this becomes another form of racial capitalism the extraction of excess value from black and brown bodies because of their racial difference. Because why? You have these urban campuses situated in the middle of communities of color that they engage in, they engage with in an extractive, in an extractive economic relationship because of this long history of the linkages between race, real estate, and labor value. How does it work today? Land, labor, policing. I got a little bit of time, I'm gonna get right to it. Land, number one, land, how and why? Because universities are identified as 401c3 institutions, nonprofits, their property is tax exempt. So as they begin to ramp up their power as a part of this knowledge economy and build out these laboratories that bridge to the north of your campus with all those properties owned by the university that are being converted into laboratories is a part of this dynamic. So as this knowledge economy ramps up and the, and, the, and the footprint of the university expands beyond the main campus, all of this for-profit land that is for laboratories and retail and housing to attract the best and brightest researchers and their families is primarily tax exempt in the name of educational purposes. What are the consequences of that? Well, you know, pin for pilots, you know what the consequence is because the money that is not being paid in property taxes is directly being extracted from the funds that are being used or should be used to upgrade schools, to maintain roads. Think about Texas, to maintain the electrical grid, to pay for snow removal, to pay for trash removal. And not only that, so those services are getting paid for because of these for-profit educational spaces, but then because these schools are there, they're raising the property values of black and brown elders who live in homes on fixed incomes. Or because as students stretch out and student and family and, and, and university families stretch out and landlords want to meet their needs, the value and the cost of rental properties goes up in the way that black and brown families can't support or cannot pay for a single family home. So that is land, labor. Well, the people who are doing the work, the STEM workers, the graduate students who are doing the work, if the first exemption is educational purposes, the shelter, the second shelter is apprenticeships. They're not considered workers. So then when a General Motors or a Google or a Bombardier or a Pfizer or a Moderna puts money into research and development for graduate students to produce research for their for-profit companies, they can write it off as an educational tax write-off. And then when the university receives that money, they can write it off as an educational purpose and then put a chunk of the money into the amorphous category of overhead costs. What about the laborers, the graduate students? Well, they have, most of them have bachelor's degrees, could go on the market and work at Pfizer or General Motors and get $60,000 with the same bachelor's degree, do some research, and then get about $100,000. But as a graduate student, they might get a $30,000 stipend. 
and then they can, they can produce some research that might generate millions in royalties for the university, and they still will get the same $30,000 stipend, while the university receives at least half of the royalties from that discovery. And these graduate students are exploited, and then they also raise housing costs in the neighborhoods where communities of color sit. And then finally, policing. As these universities engage in expansion and extraction economically and spatially around these communities, all of this dynamic is being policed by private security forces. And if it's a private university like Penn or UChicago, they have public authority, private, private power, public authority without public oversight. Public universities and public campus police are not subject to Freedom of, of Information Act laws. So they can do what they want and it's governed by the interests and the needs of the Board of Trustees and the administrations. So this becomes a form of extraterritorial expansion. Beyond the brick and mortar buildings, these police are setting the table for behavior management, for land regulation, and for gentrification and displacement. So taken together, what I call these universe cities become the planning apparatus for extracting land, labor, and behavior in the name of the knowledge economy and black and brown communities upon which these universities sit are left holding the bag, literally. Now I'm out of time, but this is not the end of the story because the very same infrastructure and pieces that generate this kind of oppressive colonial apparatus can be retrofitted and reorganized to build a different way. We have a historical legacy of black and brown students and community colleges like Merritt College in Oakland, Malcolm X Community College in Chicago, the City University of talking about these areas and converting them into commons. So before that term got popular in the last 20 years, in the 80s, they were talking about commoning, turning university campuses into commons for the people. We have in my book, I give a host of solutions, of talking about issues that can retrofit, that can reimagine, that can rethink the very same tools and resources into shifting these spaces from profit universities into people's universities. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for such a clear-headed analysis of the university and also the nexus of land, labor, and policing. Next, we turn to Dr. Jolian Thomas, Jolian Baraka Thomas, who is going to help us think a little bit more specifically about the call for pilots. And um, Dr. Thomas is an assistant professor and interim graduate chair of religious studies at Penn. He is the author of Drawing on Tradition, Manga, Anime, and Religion in Contemporary Japan, which came out in 2012 and Faking Liberties, Religious Freedom in American Occupied Japan, which came out in 2019. And if that wasn't enough, his current book manuscript, Difficult Subjects, Religion and the Politics of Public Schooling in Japan and the US is under contract currently with the University of Chicago Press. So once again, join me in a warm Zoom. Welcome to Dr. Jolian Thomas. Thank you, Dr. Strong. And I want to say thank you um, to all of you for uh, joining us today for this conversation. I'm really excited to hear your thoughts, uh, and I've been watching them come through in the chat. Um, so uh, I am an assistant professor of religious studies. I'm doing research on uh, the politics of public schooling right now, as Dr. Strong mentioned. I'm also an organizer with Pen for Pilots, and in a moment I'll talk about our work. But first of all, I want to thank Dr. Baldwin uh, for writing a book that is both infuriating and inspiring. It's infuriating because it shows in gut-wrenching detail how institutional self-interest can hide behind talking points about community uplift or the public good. But it's also inspiring, particularly inspiring, because it doesn't just stop at that critique. It also shows that some of the alternative arrangements that university communities like ours can adopt. These arrangements include uh, creative answers to the questions of how municipal revenue is generated, who wins lucrative building contracts or dining contracts, where the food even comes from in the first place, and whether private police forces are gonna stalk territory that universities will unilaterally claim as their own. 
Dr. Baldwin's epilogue in particular provides us with a model partially drawn from the University of Winnipeg of how a university can humbly blend into its city and work collaboratively with local residents rather than merely extracting value through dominance of real estate and retail markets. Now, Penn appears at several places in the content chapters that precede that epilogue. It appears as an example of the sort of entity that is, in Dr. Baldwin's evocative phrase, plundering our city. So I want to talk about that plunder first and in concrete terms. Dr. Baldwin shows, and he just spoke briefly about this, that research done on tax-exempt university property, often on behalf of private companies, can generate lucrative patents in the royalties that follow. University hospitals will sometimes specialize in boutique procedures for high paying clients while turning away local trauma patients. In the case of public institutions, the slashing of funding for higher education at the state level sometimes forces universities to seek partnerships with for profit corporations. Meanwhile, wealthy private universities like Columbia will use their clout to part with elected and appointed officials, sometimes using eminent domain to force small businesses out of neighborhoods to deliberately leave areas undeveloped so that they can be marked as blighted and then uh, residents can be forced out as they remake these areas in their own image. Community institutions like restaurants and bars disappear or are first forcibly relocated, or they become unaffordable to their longstanding clientele, unrecognizable. Property tax rates for small business owners skyrocket as university cited retail stores hoover up valuable student and faculty dollars without having to pay a single cent in property taxes themselves. And traditional public spaces disappear as universities physically restructure buildings around inward facing courtyards, the entry to which requires either a university ID or a visible high degree of disposable income. The private police forces patrol our neighborhoods. They stop and frisk black and brown residents at alarming rates. At the University of Chicago, 100% of pedestrians stopped by the university police in 2016 were black. As Dr. Baldwin writes of Arizona State University, quote, by depicting the world beyond campus as dangerous, the university turned students away from the city and made them a captive market for the retailers and restaurants affiliated with the university. This same sentence could easily be said of Penn, and we should all think of this economic fact every time our phones buzz with one of those irritating and frankly quite offensive campus security alerts. So this book therefore demands the attention of all of us who have any stake in Penn or the city of Philadelphia. Now, I work as an organizer for a group of faculty and staff called Penn for Pilots. For years, Penn students have called on the university to offer payments in lieu of taxes. Pilots, as these payments are known, are formal arrangements between tax-exempt institutions and municipal governments. The tax-exempt entity offers some percentage of foregone, foregone property taxes to the city. A pilot is an acknowledgement that while a tax-exempt organization may perform some public benefit, it also relies on municipal services. My colleagues and I formed Pen for Pilots last year because it was downright embarrassing that students were bearing the burden of putting pressure on Penn to make pilots. They didn't have explicit support from faculty and staff. And furthermore, as professional educators, we were inspired to act because a number of journalistic exposés revealed the deplorable state of Philadelphia's underfunded schools. That includes toxic environmental hazards such as asbestos, lead paint, and non-potable water in physical plants, as well as shortages for crucial staff such as counselors and special ed teachers. We wanted to see Penn's immense wealth, its endowment of nearly $15 billion, not only support the nearby Penn Alexander School, where many children of Penn faculty attend, but all schools throughout Philadelphia. Getting that to happen requires thinking outside of the anchor institution playbook that's partially been pioneered by Penn. It, it requires thinking beyond the parameters of just public-private partnership. It requires getting back to the notion of universities uh, receiving tax exemption because they contribute directly, not indirectly, to the public good. It requires universities to think of actually existing publics thinking of neighbors and citizens and neighborhoods rather than target market demographics. So we set about contributing to a citywide campaign led by Philadelphia Jobs with Justice. We organized a petition calling on Penn to offer 40% of foregone property taxes. We wanted it to be distributed to an educational equity fund that would directly support Philly schools. By our estimates, 40% of foregone property taxes on, M on Penn's estimated $3.2 billion in urban real estate would generate approximately $40 million annually. For perspective, that's only about a quarter of 1% of Penn's endowment. 
earmarked for schools, the funds at this level would quickly help to identify or to rectify the sort of environmental hazards I mentioned a moment ago. More than 1,150 faculty and staff have signed our petition. Many more community members have reached out to express their support for our campaign. Simultaneously, students and alumni created their own petition, threatening to withhold donations to Penn until Penn volunteered to contribute its fair share to the city. Journalists caught wind of our movement. They wrote critical pieces about Penn's relationship with the city. The Philadelphia Inquirer and editorial board endorsed the call for pilots. And within five months of the public launch of our campaign, Penn President Amy Gutman announced a major gift to the city to be delivered in the form of $10 million payments annually over the next 10 years. In interviews, President Gutman has staunchly rejected the idea that this charitable gift counts as a pilot, but it was nevertheless clear that our campaign got results. It was also clear that we were only able to get Penn to make this relatively paltry concession through concerted effort involving lots of different entities. Students, faculty, staff, and community organizers were all crucial. And on behalf of our organization, I wanna say thank you to all of you for your efforts. But the question that remains for all of us is what we should do next. At Penn for Pilots, we're adamant that $100 million is just a first step. It's a down payment on repaying Penn's debt to the city. Penn wants us to think of it as a charitable donation. Penn wants uh, to lap up accolades for its largesse. But we call for a radical reimagining of who is the real giver and who is the actual recipient in the relationship between Penn and Philly. The citizens of Philadelphia have given Penn a gift many times over in the form of tax exemption, no questions asked. Private nonprofits like universities get tax exemption because they supposedly relieve the municipal government of some burden. But over the last several decades, private wealthy nonprofits like Penn have been able to use tax exemption as a dodge, even as they've taken on increasingly profit-driven corporate structures. Dr. Baldwin describes this on page 13. He says the unqualified belief in higher education's public good creates a lucrative shelter economy where tax exempt status helps generate significant private profit for schools without public discussion and with little public benefit. So as faculty and staff, I wanna say that we can call our employer to account. Penn wants to naturalize its decision. It wants to make them seem like foregone conclusions. Penn also wants to adopt the mantle of the enlightened do-gooder, but only wants to do good on its own terms, largely through unequal and inequitable partnerships rather than through a more humble attitude of service and citizenship. Now, to be sure, Partnership is not necessarily a bad thing, but none of the relationships between Penn and the city are natural. Giving tax exempt status to any entity is a choice. And if it is a choice, then that means we can choose otherwise. City council and the mayor's office can call on Penn to clarify which of its properties are actually deserving a tax exemption. They can threaten a forensic audit. And for its part, Penn can prove that it's actually interested in the public good by opening up university properties to the public rather than restricting them to Penn faculty, staff, and students. Making any of these changes would necessarily trigger others. For example, what need is there for a private police force when the taxpaying public is properly understood as a co-owner of a campus? Now, I find inspiration in Dr. Baldwin's book because he shows us how people are reimagining universities so that all stakeholders, including city residents, have a seat at the table. At a time when skeletons are literally falling out of Penn's closets, I think it's high time for us to open the doors to the boardroom and let everyone in. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thomas, for a really wonderful set of remarks that highlight both the subtle and spectacular processes of university plunder, the specific campaign for Penn to pay pilots beyond charity, and also the reminder that faculty have an important, albeit typically underutilized role to play in campus struggles toward justice. So I am so delighted to now introduce Abdul Ali Muhammad, who is a Philadelphia-born organizer, writer, and co-founder of the Black and Brown Workers Cooperative. In their work, they often problematize medical surveillance and discuss the importance of bodily autonomy in center Blackness. And in the chat, I will actually um, link uh, Abdul Ali's most recent work that was very pivotal in bringing to light um, Penn Museum's role in um, unethically holding on to the remains of Delisha Africa and Tree Africa of the Move organization. 
So please join me in offering yet another warm Zoom welcome to Abdullah Ali Muhammad. Hi, can y'all hear me? Do this. Um, I wanna thank, thank you, Crystal. Um, whoo, Crystal. <laughs> I just appreciate Crystal Strong so much. Dr. Strong, am I, call, am I using titles? Okay, Dr. Strong. And um, is a, um, a dear comrade of mine. And we've been through some stuff in these streets. <laughs> and so I appreciate being here with you and in conversation with you and um, the, uh, Dr. Baldwin. <laughs> Thank you for your book. Um, it's I've been working through it. I haven't completed it, but uh, you know I have some. Thank you for all your work, your scholarship, and um, you know one of the things I want to talk about is how you describe like these cities that universities plunder as universities. I thought that was an interesting concept, and it kind of. I mean, I'll talk about it in a minute, but I I think that's very very crucial to this conversation your description of what a university is. And um, Jolien, thank you so much, or Dr. Thomas, thank you for all the work around Pin, and Pin for Pilots and um, your scholarship and your work as well. Um, it's been a heavy week, it's been a heavy year. Um, I am currently getting over COVID, so bear with me as I take breaths and try to be as present as possible and try to connect dots. <laughs> and I wanna to disclose too, I'm not an academic. You know, I, I went to college briefly at community college. Uh, uh, my major at the time was communication. So I don't really uh, use a lot of language that academics use. So excuse me for that. And I would say, you know, lastly, um, that, you know, this, this is a conversation, this is a topic that I've been thinking about since I've been able to be aware of displacement politics. Um, as someone who grew up in West Philadelphia, and I'll get into my history in a minute. Um, I guess I'll start here. Um, Crystal said that I, you know, I'm one of the co-founders of the Black and Brown Workers Cooperative. And the, the work of the BBWC started in the context of nonprofits, right? And um, anti-black. Um, anti-blackness in those workplaces, as well as um, workplace violence and sexual assault that was happening specifically in HIV nonprofits um, in Philadelphia. And I worked in, in HIV nonprofits, uh, non nonprofit spaces for over 10 years, collectively speaking, and I am someone living with HIV. And so I was in this very precarious kind of space between institution and community because I also received my care at Mazzoni Center while working there. Um, so I can speak about my experience as a patient and also as an employee. Um, and one of the things that the BBWC noticed when we formed was the, that the, the leadership structure of these orgs was white and that the frontline staff mostly were black and brown and reflective of the communities the organizations served and didn't have voice. Um, and so we started organizing. Um, we successfully uh, ousted then um, director of the Office of LGBT Affairs, Nellie Fitzpatrick, um, who when we were addressing racism in the neighborhood and, and at these nonprofits, um, de denied that, you know, she could do anything about it, right? She said that her office dealt with uh, LGBTQ issues and that PCHR dealt with like race and other protected categories. Um, so she didn't see that Black people can be both Black and LGBTQ. <laughs> um, and so we called for her resignation. Um, there's so much history about that that y'all can read. Um, and then what we started noticing in our work is, um, is the need to talk about displacement politics and how it impacts workers, especially workers on the margins. Um, the Black and Brown Workers Co-op is Black-led, is also led by trans and non-binary people and queer folks. Um, and so, you know, we uh, people within the co-op and outside of the co-op 
um, were being displaced. And we felt like we needed to address that. And in 2018, we, we began talking about um, displacement politics um, in a campaign called Disappearing Blackness is Displacement Politics. So that's a little bit of background about my organizing work. And outside of that, I write, I think about the body a lot. I think about disease um, or being viewed as someone diseased. Um, I think about medical surveillance because as a pause person, I'm surveilled because of my status. Um, and so there's a lot of connections and deep um, roots in the work that I do and the things that I talk about. So that's a little bit about the work that I do. I wanna talk about where I grew up. So I was born in 1983 to two Muslim parents who were black um, in West Philadelphia. My mother is from um, West Philly from the bottom um, or thereabout. She grew up in West Park Apartments on 46th Street and Market, the projects. Um, she went to Allen Lock. <laughs> um, and my father, um, he grew up in Germantown. So, you know, two different kind of worlds, but in Philly. Um, and they met when my mother was visiting my uncle who was incarcerated at FCI Otisville in New York uh, because my father was also incarcerated. Um, and, and they met in 1980, he got out on appeal in, in uh, I mean, they met in 1980 and he got out on appeal in 1982. I was born in 1983, October 26, 1983. I'm giving you all this autobiographical information because I want y'all to know how deeply rooted I am in Philadelphia. Um, and so I, you know, when I was young, we were in a, a black Muslim community along the 52nd Street corridor. Um, about 89, my mom decided to leave that community and we moved to Farson Street, which is right by 52nd and Market. And in 91, my, um, the home that my uncle owned, the uncle that was in FCI Otisville, um, he, had, he had the house in my grandmother's name because he knew he was involved in um, underground economies. And so he had the house in my grandmother's name. At the time, there was a tenant who just, um, you know, wouldn't leave, and my grandmother wanted that tenant to leave and wanted to give the home to my mom. And so around 90, the late 91, 92, we moved into 5011 Pintridge Street, which is right by Baltimore Avenue. Um, and, you know, growing up, this, like the 90s, as I said, um, I remember that the barrier between like, mostly white folks <laughs> and, and the black folks who lived on my block was um, it, it, it started or ended. The border was at 49th and Baltimore, right? Past 49th Street, I would, you know, take my mongoose with pogos and be on my bike. You know, it was mostly white people as you kind of like went down Baltimore Avenue, right? And, and up past 49th Street, it was mostly black and brown folks. And I remember growing up and then noticing some changes in the neighborhood, right? In composition. Um, the fact that Beulah Baptist, which is now the co-op, that started losing members, moved uh, somewhere else. Um, that building was closed. A lot of like barbecue spots that used to be along uh, Baltimore Avenue, um, you know, Charlie's and Kim's that used to be on Baltimore, you know, the, uh, the Firehouse Farmer's Market, all these things started to shift around me. And I didn't have a name for it. I knew that things were happening and people were moving off of the block that I grew up on, right? The families I, I knew, some of them started to move into um, Upper Darby or Darby. Some people moved way past um, 55th Street, like up over on uh, Woodland Avenue. And then other people moved into parts of North Philadelphia that was away from Temple, right? So people were being, and, and I didn't know that people were being displaced or being, or their houses were being foreclosed on or that, you know, 
rent pressure was was driving them away. I just knew that they were leaving the neighborhood, right? I knew that they were, weren't on Pinterest Street anymore. And this is the late 90s, the early 2000s. Um, and so I have a very clear picture of how um, university encroachment kind of impacted me as a Black person and, um, and my family and the people that I, you know, I love and care for and the people who I grew up with. Um, and so it's not just a theoretical question for me, right? It's not just an academic question. It's, a, it's about how I'm able to live as a poor Black person um, from, from this neighborhood and how I can continue to hold on and be rooted here in, in a neighborhood that I, I'm deeply connected to. Um, and so I wanna go back to disappearing Blackness. So in 2018, disappearing Blackness um, campaign started happening. We started targeting different institutions. One of those institutions was Mary, Mary Posta Food Co-op where I used to work at. <laughs> Uh, in full disclosure, and I also was uh, the board convener at one time um, after working there. Um, and I really tried pushing that institution on naming what they meant by community, right? And in and, and, uh, and, uh, and, like talking about their complicity um, in gentrification, but they didn't budge. Um, so we targeted Mary Posta, we targeted Dock Street, um, Little Babies, and um, and the coffee shop that's on Baltimore, I keep forgetting that coffee shop's name now. Um, and the reason why I want to talk about Mariposa is because it has a connection to Penn, right? The, um, I'm looking at my notes, so I don't get this wrong, but um, the movement for a new society, um, a lot of its members went to Penn. And we, you know, when we talk about gentrification and encroachment, it's a long process, right? Um, the, the, the movement for a new society started in the 60s or the late 50s. And so, and a lot of their members were part of the left and created cooperatives, right? And one of those cooperatives um, survived today as Mariposa. One of those co-ops is now in PFCU. One of those co-ops is now the LCA, which is a housing cooperative. And so they're all tied to this conversation about pioneers, right? When you talk, when we talk about urban renewal or development, um, um, like Dr. Baldwin does in his book, um, you you know, understanding this conversation around pioneers, right? People who move to neighborhoods before it's like the thing to do, right? The folks who like moved into West Philly back then in the '70s and the '80s and the '90s, who were um, young white people who were connected to the left, right? Who um, might have squatted or might have lived in a, in a housing co-op. Um, it, it was all connected to this, this movement. And, and now, you know, and years later, those institutions or, or the institutions that this movement has birthed is, is complicit, just like Penn, right? And um, displacing Black people in these Black neighborhoods, right? And, um, you know, Penn's expansion led ultimately to Maddie Post's expansion from down the street to 48th in, in, in Baltimore into the form of Eula Baptist Church building, right? So for a long time, Maddie Post was down for, further on Baltimore. Um, and it was a small space that people had a key to that they can go in and get groceries, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, they ended up expanding um, in like 2015, I believe, um, to 48th Street, 48th and um, Baltimore Avenue. And so that, that is connected to Penn's kind of encroachment, Penn's um, broad development of different medical institutions that move people here and people seek out, you know, communities where there's co-ops or, you know, institutions that fit with their politics. And so um, one of the things that the BBWC pointed out is that that institution is participating in displacement because people are moving here because they work at Penn or, um, you know, close by at, a, a, at another institution and they didn't want to live by a food co-op. Um, and so we challenged that idea of, uh, challenged that organization and named them as anti-Black. And a lot of people in West Willie, you know, thought it was funny, thought that 
you know, our analysis was off because, oh, the, you know, Maddie Post says for everyone. My brother who grew up in that neighborhood says to me, every time he talks about Mediposa, he says, oh, that white store. That's how neighbors that I grew up with saw that institution. So it's not, it is inaccessible. Price points are inaccessible. The culture of the space is inaccessible to black people who are uh, you know, rooted in this neighborhood. And one anecdote is when I was working there, a black elder came in and you know they have a bulk section, a bulk um, bean. They had bulk beans, dried beans, and he was mad. And I, 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 I you know, I, I was okay with that because we had no lima beans. There was no dried lima beans for him to cook, and he was so upset. He's like, "Why, well, you know, this, this, this is in my neighborhood, and y'all don't have lima beans." And so that just shows you about like the lack of like, cultural aware, awareness that the buyers at that co-op have and had, you know, um, and how, and how, you know, they're not here for Black folks who've been here generationally. Um, another few points that I want to make. Um, did, is, is that my 10 minutes? No. Am I? So then I'll stop if I talk too much. <laughs> You are not talking too much at all. And I do just want to um, thank you so much, Comrade Abdul Ali, for really reminding us and regrounding us that these processes that we're talking about are very intimate. They're intimately held and experienced by members of Philadelphia communities. Um, I saw several people nodding their head, including myself. Um, around just how how much what you are saying resonates for those of us who are Philadelphia um, from Philadelphia or long term Philadelphia residents, and so I do just want to thank you for bringing us back to the matter of life and living, right. Uh, in addition to that, just as a, a note from the moderator, I do want to invite us to not do the title politics thing today. Um, and I want to apologize if I perhaps unintentionally participated in that. Um, you know, we are we do not want to reproduce the framing of the university as being valued more or better or differently than the knowledges that are held by community members. And so thank you for drawing that out. And I hope we can commit to that collectively for the rest of this conversation. Um, so we have a bit of time now for some conversation. And there are a few questions that came in through the chat. And I also have a few um, framings that I think may be a site for us to explore together. But before I do that, I wanted to invite Devarian to perhaps, if you have any immediate responses to the, the presentation of Jolian and Abdul Ali to offer those, um, particularly since there's such a, a rich thread across all of the, the remarks. And so please, we do want to um, provide some space for you to, to respond if you would like before we get into the questions. So I, I first of all, just wanna thank you, Crystal, for uh, your brilliance in moderating this conversation, but also for the brilliance of my co-panelists co um, in their remarks, uh, they're both astute, um, time with the text, but also with just the lived experience that the text attempts to elucidate. Um, Abdul Ali, I know you talked a little bit about not having certain language or whatever, but that's, I just want to say that this book wouldn't have been possible. It's, it's built on people just like you with the, with the indigenous and local and the intellectual knowledge, the combination, you know, talking about the body, but talking about it within a very embodied context of local history, um, landmark based, uh, family based history that it's it's the collection of, of artists and and local journalists and activists that that gave this text any kind of legitimacy. Because I knew that when I would travel around the country talking about this text, if I couldn't give the bona fides, people would go, well, what are you talking about? What is the point of this? What are you saying? You, you, this is kind of aerial view. This is what we get all the time. So if I was really trying to break the mold and thinking of differently about how we do this kind of work, it had to be from people like you with that, with that, with that local, but at the same time, far reaching knowledge, thinking about the local knowledge in a different way, in a different frame. And so I just want to say that 
And Jolie, I just want to also thank you for your your close attention to the text and, and for your work with Pen for Pilots um, and, and your and your astute analysis of the of the gift matrix that I talk about elsewhere. I wrote a piece in Time Magazine about that focused on the Pen for Pilots campaign uh, because of the ways in which the notion of gift um, is a legal uh, uh, bait and switch, okie doke, if you will, uh, whereby by calling it a gift doesn't acknowledge a long standing relationship between the city and the university. That the very thing you're calling a gift is actually extracted from the dollars that are not being paid into this. So the gift is coming from the city itself, from the community itself. Like you said, it's a gift in reverse, it's a boomerang gift. And so I, I thank you for, for highlighting um, that point and that what needs to happen is a restructuring of the entire budget, that, that pilots are an amazing beginning, but we must we, we need an abolitionist vision whereby the current conditions and, and arrangements are freed from themselves. And a, and a new alignment between and a forensic analysis of the budgets that don't just talk about the the the, the matrix the metric between uh, uh, tuition and teaching classes, but bring, make sheds light on the technology transfer department, the real estate office, the police budget, the foundation budget, all those shadow budgets that never get talked about when universities push an austerity approach onto their faculty and workers and then extend it onto their communities. So I just want to say I thank y'all so much for your observations and your insights, and it only makes this conversation uh, that much more rich. So thank you. Thank you so much for that response. And I do think, especially because we have um, about 20, or we, we have a bit of time for some, some more conversation, I want to maybe lay out some of the themes that um, emerged to me in this conversation and also came up in the chat as well. So one is around this notion of community partnership and benefit. The other is around the question and possibility of reparations. And then one that was very prominent in the chat was around the question of labor and grad students in particular and unionization and the way that that might be a part of this conversation. So how about we start with the first one? Community partnership, as you write so beautifully in this book, and as anyone who's familiar with Penn and the way it describes its work, community partnership is an important part of the way that universities in general and Penn specifically justify their nonprofit status and the reasons why they're not paying taxes to their cities, right? And you describe in detail um, the role of the Penn Netter Center for community partnership in this kind of relationship. And there's a very interesting tension and contradiction in the text itself that you are able to pull out in interviewing two different individuals. So you talk with the urban planner, Harley Etienne, who describes the Netter Center in the work as being deployed to provide a moral cover for Penn's real estate office. And then on the other hand, you discuss Ira Harkavy discussing the Netter Center as an unacceptable compromise for the greater good. And so I'm wondering if we can talk about this notion of community partnership and the question of benefit. Is there a better way and what is it? And I think we see some examples in your book and also we've heard alluded in the other presentation, some other frameworks that we might call in in thinking about what, what the, the notion of partnering with the community should look like. Wow, I mean, I don't need to re re talk about that th that part. You did it expertly well. Y'all just follow up with what she said, what Crystal said. I'm sorry, she, Crystal said. Uh, the, the relationship that I was able to untangle between uh, Harley Etienne and Ira Huckabee, who are both, I, I talked to both of them and, and I'm cool with all of them. And it's just, I followed the materials and and Harley Etienne, who's now at Michigan, but was a graduate student at Temple when he wrote a book about UPenn, um, pointed out that the Netter Center, which is the, the Center for Community Partnerships at your institution, at the institution of U, UPenn, um, has, you know, their main job was to engage in these partnerships with community organizations. And Ira is very explicit about, you know, if the programs that we do are not helping residents, then they're not helping anyone. But the, on the flip side, on the underside of that is that the real estate department was watching what the community partnership office was saying. So when the 
Netter Center was saying, we need to be good neighbors. The real estate office said, yes, you're right. And so what that meant was buying up properties and land banking them until a high profile uh, 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 scientist comes in and needs a lab and flipping it and turning it to laboratory. So holding on to it, letting it be blighted or keeping it off the tax rolls and then waiting for scientists to come in. What good neighbor meant was um, creating a housing program for faculty and their affiliates that, ra that ultimately raised the, 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 the values of housing above the uh, capacity of local residents or cut them up for students in ways that not no longer made them available for a, a working poor, uh, single black or brown family. What good neighbor meant was putting in amenities with like a, a, a restaurant and a cinema on 40th and Market and, uh, 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 you know, as you mentioned, uh, food stores that explicitly cater, as, as Abdu Ali pointed out, cater to the needs and interests of resident, of, of, excuse me, of faculty and students and not to residents and definitely not at their price points. And so this notion of community partnership and then routed through this language of good neighbor was created by the institution of cultural partners, but it was used by the real estate department and office whereby community partnerships unintentionally or intentionally served as cover. So in response to that, when I, when I asked Ira about it, he said, well, yeah, maybe we were used, maybe we were deployed, but I'm willing to put up with that as long as I have a seat at the table. And so then we must ask, what is the consequence of that? Him having a seat or those people, just not to put him on the spot, but those people having a seat at the table um, to decide how partnerships will be meted out to the community. And, and, there, and, the, and the pandemic showed that there are um, alternatives. So for example, um, during the pandemic, U Chicago began to package up unused um, food um, from the cafeterias and started packaging it into healthy meals that was distributed to communities of need. But the question I have is that, why wasn't that being done all the time? Why did they require a, a global pandemic? Because we know that, that legally, they had to throw the food away the next day. All, all restaurants, all food service places had to do that. So why weren't they doing that all the time, right? Another example, at Harvard, and we realized, talk, I mentioned, I see all the com, com, conversations about, about, um, about labor beyond grad students. We know that when we talk about employment, that most of the employment at a university is not faculty and grad students. It's primarily black and brown women in the low wage labors of food service, grounds crews, and administrative assistants at low wages, at below the fight for 15 wage that we've all been fighting for. And yet we celebrate that they have jobs, but they're ended up having to work one or two jobs to make ends meet. These are on nine month cycles so that in the summertime they have to find an additional job. And because they're not full-time all year round, they don't have full-time health benefits for them and their children. So we celebrate good jobs, but these jobs are barely working poor status. So with that in mind, um, during the pandemic, Harvard was offering furlough to those employees that were directly employed by the university. What we're finding out is that more and more university employees are being subcontracted through other entities. And so when a union agreement is made with direct employees, the subcontract workers don't benefit from those, those agreements. And that's by design. So this is happening all over the country. So what we're seeing now are these campaigns at Columbia, at UVA, where the labor, the vision of labor is including graduate workers, faculty, and low wage service workers, and sometimes even those workers outside the campus into larger coalitions. New Haven Rising in New Haven, Connecticut is doing that with um, Yale workers both off and on campus because they understand that because universities are the biggest employers in the city, that they're setting the wage ceiling for the entire city. The wages they set determine how much other companies that are not related to universities have to pay in order to keep their employees. So this is not just about the ivory tower. That's why my chapter at the end is called the ivory tower is dead because these universities are setting the wage ceiling, the land value, the policing priorities for entire cities. And so there are tons of ways in which universities can do better. Winnipeg, if you read my epilogue, I'm not gonna go into it now, but they're, 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 the university is building housing. Now let's be clear, it's because of student protests and community protests because of their bad behavior from decades before, but to their credit, they're building housing that's for both campus residents and non-campus residents at price points from premium 
market to affordable to even better rent geared to income because they had a, a democratic socialist province. Let's be clear, politics matters. Um, so they, they were doing that. That also they made their student government open up slots because student government pays for daycare on the campus. So they opened up slots for community members. And then they fired one of the multinational food service corporations, Sodesco, Marriott, which, whichever one, Aramark, and they created their own diversity foods where 65% of their employees are hired from marginalized communities, LGBTQ, uh, recently incarcerated, single mother, new Canadian, what we call uh, immigrants. And then they get, they get 65% of their resources, their materials for cooking from um, local farms within a hundred kilometer radius. And they have, they take their cooking oil and send it out to be converted into biodiesel. So when people fold their arms and say, yeah, DeVarian, you're just being critical, uh, critical, 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 what's the solution? There are tons of solutions. This is not rocket science. This is not uh, 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 unicorns and rainbows. This is something we can do right here in our face. This is right in our faces, practical, if we have the courage of will to see it. So, sorry. I went, I went, above, went beyond. Thank you. That was much appreciated. And I think you actually, in, in, in many ways, attended to some of the questions that were additional questions that were raised around labor and subcontracting and grad student unionization. So thank you for bringing both of those together. Um, Abdul Ali, um, Jolien, would you like to comment on this point of community partnership and benefit? Go ahead if you'd like to do it, Abdul Ali. Um, you can go. I'll just say one thing, um, and this is related to the, the politics point that Devarian mentioned a moment ago. Um, so Pen for Pilots represents, uh, you know, as I mentioned, there's our steering committee, but then there are, you know, 1,100 faculty who we represent, and they all have different ranges of commitment to this notion of community partnership. Some of those faculty mm -hmm are doing research or they're teaching classes that directly require some of these partnerships with say like local schools, for example, through the Graduate School of Education. And I think that that's important. So I, 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 I will, I'm just sort of throwing that out there as a preface to say lots of different faculty are gonna have lots of different um, takes uh, on this issue. Um, but one thing that I noticed in the book um, that I was hoping I could sort of turn into a question for Devarian is that, of those 100 interviews, we have a lot of individuals like Ira Harkavy who are, who are coming up and we have them speaking and we have community voices speaking, but inevitably we always have the university acting as its own agent, right? Like the university ends up speaking as a, a sort of singular voice. It appears to be this monolithic entity. And yet anybody who spent time on a university campus or in any kind of organization organizers, whatever, will know that all organizations are, um, e are constructed of all of these different parts, lots of different constituencies and so forth. Um, so one thing that I was left with was wondering how uh, we um, politically or strategically, uh, perhaps tactically think about um, getting those individual voices and, and reconciling them with the, the voice or the stance that the university adopts. Because one of the things that I see is that you know, we can talk with the, in one of your chapters, you talk with the disaffected person, I think it was at ASU who had worked in their development office and then, you know, had stepped away and was talking critically about um, what actually happened behind the scenes. So we can get those people's voices, but then the logic of the university as this um, owner of real estate, uh, as this um, employer that wants to get the lowest wage still comes through at, at the end. Um, how do, we, how do we break it up? How do we talk, how do we get so that we're talking with people and not talking with the institution? Uh, I, I, this is a, a, a big question. I'm not quite sure if, if I even know like where to, where to begin, but it's something that came, th came through to me as I was reading the book. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Abdul Ali, did you wanna answer the first question first before I answer that question about community um, engagement and partnerships before sure. I talk no, to this? I, yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, I struggle with the term partnership, right? I, I, I want to know like what Penn identifies as a definition of partnership. I think about when I think of quote unquote partnership, I think about how the community isn't necessarily considered, looked at, appreciated 
as an equal partner by an institution like Penn. Penn doesn't respect communities, right? So like, I, I just question like this concept of partnership because to me, it would, it would, I feel like to have a meaningful partnership that would have to be one, some understanding of positionality of who, who has power in that conversation, who has resource in that conversation and who does it and who's coming into that conversation from the standpoint of like, trying to demand and trying to push on an institution with all these resources to like somehow quote unquote gift those resources to community partners. Um, so I just, I challenged the, the concept, right? Around partnership. And I wanna understand it as like a less vague term too. Um, so that's what I'll, I'll say about that. Mm. Well, um, um... Julian, if you remember in, in the chapter where I discuss Ira Harkavy, before that, I speak to Henry Lewis Taylor, who was a tight colleague with Ira, but they differ in approach. And, and, and uh, Henry Lewis Taylor is a Black Marxist that was, brought as, that was brought to University of Buffalo to do the similar kind of work that Ira was brought to UPenn to do. But his approach to community partnerships was that he, he did the work and he concluded, well, the only way this can work is by turning the university into a commons, that the university can't be elevated as an ivory tower by the community. It must be embedded and in service to that community. Every, every resident should have a membership so that all resources and venues and facilities are equitably accessible. And the university said, oh, hell no, we can't do that, right? We, 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 we might be able to offer some discounted memberships to the gym, to the community member. We can't be talking about no commons. So, so, so these possibilities are embedded within our archives of, of, content, of, re, of residual traces of, of real possibilities. And so I, I, I invoke that notion of commons to say that we go wrong when we continue to try to appeal to people, faculty like me who have tenure, fat, fat and, 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 and well-fed. Um, and and we, we continue to turn our attention to people like me or administrators say, you know, will you please listen to my demo? Will you please hear me? Instead of saying, okay, you stay there and do what you're gonna do. My values are not gonna be determined by the campus culture. I'm gonna create values based on my relationship to the neighborhood where I sit. And we're gonna both cultivate a culture of care and reciprocity and mutual aid. And then people will join us and build with us. And then the campus, the official lever will have no other chance or option but to join us if they want to win, because this becomes a new common sense. This becomes the, the, the new consciousness and, and awareness and understanding of how this is about to go down for the future. So, so that's what I say to that, that if we build without um, desiring that recognition, but recognition for each other, um, other things, it's not, it, well, it's not inevitable, it's not a guarantee, but then even when, when so even when the shit hits the fan, we, we know we have each other in times of pandemic and crisis. And, and that's what we can do. So that when the university denies me tenure or when I'm, I'm that, that anonymous uh, uh, um, administrator at U Chicago, who I spoke to, but you mentioned, I'm catching hell by my bosses. I know that I'm born up when I go into the community because they value me and what I do. And that when I'm lonely, I need a meal. So for example, when the students at, at Columbia in 68 protested of the building of a, of, a, of a gym in the middle of Morningside Park, and they called it Jim Crow, G-Y-M, and they were, they were boarded up inside the administration buildings. It was residents who were coming to the campus, sending them soul food plates through the window mm -hmm. and letting Ho Chi Minh and the Black Panther Party know what was going on and to come to bear witness. So that ultimately, that gym didn't get built. So that's, that's what I say about how this can be done. Thank you so, so much for um, the last comments in particular. I was wondering and secretly hoping that someone would question the terms of the question in and of itself, particularly because partnership and the idea of community partnership is like the, what universities tell themselves in the world that they do to justify what they really do. And so thank you so much for questioning the terms itself and also DeVarian for pointing us to tangible ways that we could see otherwise. Um, I know that our time is drawing to a close. And so I'm hoping that we could do maybe a final round of comments that turn on the 
idea and the possibility of reparations, which I know is very important to your thinking, Devarian, and also your thinking, Abdul Ali. In a recent article called the reparations movement in higher education, which I'll link in the chat in a moment, Devarian writes that reparations has become not simply a call to reckon with the past, but a beacon to chart the course for a shared future. And I will also um, give um, immense credit to Abdul Ali Muhammad in particular for, for elevating the charge and the requirement of reparations for Penn's role in the Morton collection and also in holding the remains of Delicia and Tree Africa. And so I'm wondering if we can, following DeVarian's um, notion that reparations is a beacon to chart the course for a shared future, I'm wondering if, if we can dwell a little there um, and think about what those uh, courses, future, uh, you know, future courses and also future possibilities could be, um, particularly in light of something that you shared at the very beginning of, the, of this conversation, Devarian, which is that universities do what you make them do. So how might we, as a, as a manner of closing, sort of think about those in tandem? And I would love to start with Abdul Ali. Thank you, Crystal. Um, I, I mean, whew, that's a, it's such a good question. It's a question I think about all the time, right? Um, so a part of what, what I think of when I think of reckoning is one, to name the harm, right? To name what happened. And then I think about reconciliation or repair. And, and the conversation of recon, reconciliation and repair is about meeting the demands of those who were harmed. And there has been a longstanding demand by Black folks in the United States for reparations. That demand has yet to be met. So again, we can't have reconciliation or repair without uh, the folks who harmed people meeting their demands. And so there is a longstanding demand, like I said, for reparations for Black folks. Um, and then I want to situate this conversation in the context of Delicia Africa and Tree Africa, whose remains were stolen, whose remains were used for instruction by Manj and by man, whose remains were trafficked across state lines, and who I believe, I believe the remains are at man's house, according to an article that I read recently um, in, in an educational publication, um, they seem to be at a man's house. I mean, we have to sit with that. I've been sitting with it since I found out this information, right? Um, and it's devastating. It's hard to, to, to witness the videos of, uh, of, uh, of a student named Weiss and of Manj looking at um, the bones of a young Black person who was murdered and talking about them like they were prehistoric bones, right? Talking about them like, it, it's just, it's, it's horrific. And so um, Dana, Marie, uh, Dana Berry um, wrote a book, uh, The Price for um, a, a, Our Pound, a Pound of Flesh, and talks about this concept of ghost value, right? The, the, the value extracted from our dead, you know, pin, what we know, because I, I don't want to say this definitively, because I feel like there's just so much we don't know about the Morton Cranial Collection still, and about and about the remains of Tree and Delicia, right? But what we know from Paul Wolf Mitchell's work is that 14 crania of Black folks were dug up from a potter's field where Franklin Field is now. Um, and used in that collection. And we know that the university has benefited from the prestige of having the crania of enslaved people, right? That, the archaea, um, that anthropology department kind of, you know, they can, they can say like, we, we have all these remains and that gives them some kind of credibility or um, prestige. We know that they have remains of moved people and there needs to be restitution, like Mike 
Africa Junior said to the family, to Black Philadelphians, because again, the United States and these institutions who benefited from slavery have yet to meet the demand of Black people, which is reparations. Thank you for that clear-headed analysis and really laying out the, the stakes and the terms uh, for moving forward. Uh, please, uh, Jolien, I'd like to invite you to also offer some concluding remarks around these questions. Yeah, thank you so much um, for inviting us to think about reparations. Um, I, I wanna just highlight a, a leitmotif that runs through Devarian's book, um, especially near the end where he cites several people who are saying, they're looking out at a city and they say, well, there was nothing really there. There's nothing really there, they say, and, and that's their sort of motive for going in and tearing down the buildings or building something new or whatever. And to say that there's nothing really there is to not see the people who inhabit that space. And um, I just finished reading the book. I spoke with my father who grew up just south of the University of Chicago um, in the, uh, the 1950s. And he was talking about how he was invisible. There was nothing really, he was the person who was not there, right? Um, and I could hear the sort of crack in his voice as he talked about that, talking about a, a particular boulevard that was the marker that cut off his neighborhood of Kenwood from Hyde Park from, and from the, the university. And that crack in his voice is the thing that is all of us sort of demanding to be heard or to be um, seen and to be acknowledged. And this is not to make it a, a personal story, but just to say that for every Black person in America, there is that little bit of something. The only other thing that I wanna add, and I'll speak specifically as a scholar of religion here and talking about the move people and Delisha in, in, in Tree Africa, is that ritual is important. And uh, for the whole time that they were in interaction, have been in interaction with the city of Philadelphia, MOVE has demanded recognition, has been continually denied it. We need to make sure that our employer, I'm speaking as a, as a Penn professor here, um, does the right thing, does what the family asks. And um, I think we're all on the same page about that, but that's, I'll just uh, wrap, wrap things up with that comment. Thank you so Thank much. You. Oh, sorry, please, uh, the variant. Please, please, please. No, um, we're almost all over time. I just want to say real briefly that this kind of work can be, can give you a sense of despair. Uh, it can be difficult and traumatic and harrowing to go through these archives, to confront these bones, to see these invisibilities and demolitions. But I say everyone on the, on the, on the call to, to fear not, to, to hold steady, to, to stay firm uh, be, because as we look at the broad encroachment of universities on our lives, that gives what seems like just pain a window for possibility. Because campuses are these all encompassing monsters, they are also therefore the sites of much broader struggles over neighborhood possibility, neighborhood equity living wages, intellectual property rights, universal health care, wealth distribution, police abolition. So for so long, we're telling our kids, our students, that universities are training grounds for the future. But when we understand how they really function in our lives, let us understand them as battlegrounds for the right now of our urban democracy. Thank you so, so much, um, particularly for your charge, um, for us to understand that we are on a battleground. <laughs> and if we are on a battleground, then that means we have to struggle and we have to fight. <laughs> and, we can, and we can win. And we can win, exactly. And so um, I think it's, it's serendipitous in a way, in a, in a, in a tragic way, but in a also, um, hopeful way that this conversation is happening in a moment of this kind of uh, horrific revelation in which we 
um, are made in this very moment to grapple in a deeper way than we perhaps have grappled with the, the um, very problem and imperative of struggling towards justice for the communities that have long been made invisible, that have long been sites of extraction and plunder and violence um, at the hands of this university. And so I'm so humbled and grateful to um, play a small role in this conversation this evening. And I do just want to thank our wonderful panelists for um, just a really wonderful program this evening that I think brings into relief the work that we have ahead of us and the tools that we need at our disposal. So I will turn it back over to Qingming who will offer us some announcements and close us out. Thank you all. Thank you everybody and thank you, Crystal. Um, we do have some announcements including the book raffle that I hope everybody will put their bid in. So. A couple, a couple announcements and things to drop into the chat. Actually, Julia, if you can help me out with this. Um, the first is that if you are someone at Penn who teaches in any capacity as a graduate student, a faculty, a staff, we invite you to join our AAU Penn chapter. Um, thank you, Julia. Um, there's really great work that we're doing and this event was sponsored by the Race and Community Justice Committee. Um, uh, that, that I am on through AAUP Penn. Uh, the second announcement is the book raffle. So um, Julia is going to drop into the chat and air table where you can fill out some information. And um, we do have quite a few number of books that we will get give away for free to you if you would, if you would like. And um, I wish you all the best in, um, in, your, in your raffling there. Um, the next announcement is that the month of May, there was a post, uh, the month of May is Abolition May. It's a month long series of actions on, with the participation of over 40 campuses across the country to demand an end to campus policing and police violence. So this uh, will be kicked off with May 3rd, a nationwide day call of work stoppage. Um, if you would like to find out more information on how you can participate, there are, downloadable templates to turn on your auto reply to withhold your labor how you can. Um, Julia will drop into the chat the Cops Off Campus Coalition um, uh, website there. So that's coming up May. It will end on May 25th to commemorate the anniversary of George Floyd's murder. Uh, so this is the entire month of May. There will be things happening every single day. Um, one of our sponsors, SNF PIDEA program will be having a virtual panel conversation on uh, racism and anti-racism next Wednesday, April 28th. Um, and we will be sending, we can send you a link to all of this through your emails. Uh, so that's a panel conversation with four professors, including Penn's very own Akira Drake Rodriguez, who is an assistant professor in city and regional planning. Um, community announcements. There will be a action, um, next Wednesday at 5.30 at the Penn Museum to demand the repatriation and reparations for the MOVE children. Uh, so that will be uh, April 28th at 5.30 and we invite you all to come out for that. This weekend, there will be a series of actions um, around uh, Mumia Abu Jamal, the political prisoner. Uh, his birthday is on Saturday and there will be um, a rally uh, between 2 to 6 p.m. on Saturday uh, to free Mumia. He's been imprisoned for over 40 years. He's um, been very ill with COVID and, and recently with a heart surgery. Um, so there will be events on Saturday this weekend as well as Sunday on the 25th um, uh, at Malcolm X Park. Uh, so all of these events are upcoming and I hope that uh, you can come to some of them. Um, and I thank everybody uh, for being here for this conversation. And we will send, the, by request, we will send out a list of the links from the chat, some of the resources and also some of the events coming up to you through your email registration. Um, and with that, 
I will formally thank everyone again and we will close out this event. <laughs>